Hello, Chuck Carnival, co-founder of FastGraphs, the Fundamentals Analyzer software tool. Most of you know me or who've been following my work know me as Mr. Valuation because valuation is something I'm very passionate about. But as I talk about valuation and produce videos like this about valuation and even write books on valuation, I do discover that a lot of people really misunderstand the importance of the concept and perhaps even the relevance of the concept. You know, if you invest in overvalued stocks, for example, doesn't mean you're going to lose money. In fact, sometimes you can actually make money. And, you know, I've talked quite a bit about being in a very inflated, highly valued, overvalued market that we're currently in. And I also have talked quite a bit about some of the best blue chip premier dividend growth stocks also being overvalued in this market. And I want to really kind of relate to what I really mean when I say that, because, you know, in the immortal words of Ben Graham, you know, he once quipped that in the short run, the market's a voting machine. People vote their dollars. That's the kind of market we're in today, a market where people have aggressively bought stocks and driven through the laws of supply and demand. The price is far above what their intrinsic values or their justified fundamental values would be. In contrast to that, you have Ben Graham talking about in the long run, and the long run is defined as, you know, to me, at least a three to five year business cycle or even longer. You know, there's been studies saying that fundamentals really dominate after 10 or 11 years. So it's a fundamental investing is a long term strategy. I just want to amplify that. Now, in the short run, the voting machine market, you can actually make a lot of money when you're buying overvalued stocks. I think what I really want to try to get across today is when you're doing that, you're leaving the realm of prudent, sound investing, and you're entering the realm of speculation. And you can often make money. There's been, you know, history is just replete with example after example of people making a lot of money speculating, whether it would be in the stock market or real estate or tulip bulbs or what have you. So it's not, nothing I'm saying here says you can't make money when you speculate. But what I really am saying is here, you need to be aware of and cognizant of the amount of risk you're taking when you're speculating and also what the potential outcomes could be and how damaging they can be if you're not careful. So I'm going to try to get you know, into some of the, the nuances of what valuation is all about. And it's really more about risk than it is about making money or losing money, but it also impacts the amount of money you'll make. And I'll try to cover as much of that as I can through this video. Now, I'm calling this video my love-hate video. I'm going to be talking mostly about companies that I absolutely love the businesses. I think they're the bluest of blue chip dividend growth stocks on the planet, but I hate their common stocks for the most part right now. I'll cover a couple that I actually think are okay today. But the reason I hate the stocks is primarily because I think these great businesses are being overvalued. So let's go ahead and get started and let's review what it is that I'm going to be covering and talking about here. I'm going to go through quite a bit, so I want you to bear with me. When I do many, many names like this, I'm going to just be touching the surface. You obviously need to be aware of that. But what I am doing here is trying to put out some information that will help you have a better perspective of what investing and what value investing and what valuation really means to you as an investor. So what I've got here is I've got a list of 17 companies. I call it the love-hate relationship. And I've listed them in order of highest or most overvalued, which is Walt Disney, to the lowest or to the least overvalued. The last two or three, actually, I would be arguing that could actually be you know, stocks that are valuable, and I'll kind of cover those last, okay? But the point I want to make is these are all blue-chip, iconic names. You know, Walt Disney, Church and Dwight, you know, Arm & Hammer Baking Soda, McDonald's, Coca-Cola, Hormel Foods, PepsiCo, Clorox, of course, the mighty Johnson & Johnson, T. Rowe Price, Walgreens Boots Alliance, etc. These are all great names here. I want to make that clear. But what I want to also do as I kind of go into this and start is I want to start out with Next Era Energy, which is actually the old Florida Power and Light, because this represents a quintessential example of the kind of stock or company, not stock, but business that I am most interested in as an investor. What I like about a company like Next Era Energy and what I have on the graph here, for those of you who aren't familiar with the graph, 
I have the company's earnings per share plotted going all the way back to the beginning of 2002. I have the dividends per share, the white line on the graph plotted going back that same distance. The dark green shaded area represents a mountain chart of the company's earnings. The area below the white line represents what percentage or portion otherwise known as the payout ratio of earnings that the company pays out in dividends. And then I take this amount of dividends down here at the bottom and I stack them on the top because I also want you to be cognizant that when you're investing in a stock, there are two components of return. You've got capital appreciation, which is the price going from point A to point B. And then when dividend paying stocks, you additionally get an additional income return from the amount of dividends that the company generates on your behalf as a shareholder. So the real point is this is exactly the kind of company that I love. These are the kind of companies I long for. I'm going to tell you it's very frustrating in today's market because these are very, very few and far between that I can find that I would be willing to invest in today. Next Air Energy is one that I would not be willing to invest in. And let me show you why. Let me do that by now overlaying monthly closing stock prices onto the graph and correlating that to the orange line on the graph, which represents intrinsic value, okay, based on earnings in this example. So now when I plot the monthly closing stock prices, I want you to focus on a couple of things here. First of all, if I go back to 2002, all the way through 2013, you can see that there was a very high correlation between the price and an intrinsic value P.E. ratio of 17.5. Okay, that's important because after 2013, I want you to notice that the valuations, you can see the P.E.s listed at the bottom of these pop-ups here. The P.E.s get higher and higher, and the stock price, of course, gets more and more separated from this orange line. This is a quintessential picture of overvaluation. Great company, performance is fantastic, dividends are growing beautifully, What's happening is you're overpaying to buy the stock, which simply means in this example, you're taking on more risk. When you are buying when the price is at or below the orange line, I would classify that personally as Mr. Valuation, as investing at value. And of course, the, the further below the orange line, the bigger your margin of safety, which is even great. And I also want to point out that when it gets above the orange line, that becomes a time when you're overpaying the stock, and that can lead to some very poor results. Now, I do want to point out, in this case, if you bought the stock just before going into the Great Recession is what the time frame I picked here, when the multiple, the P.E. ratio of this stock was 20, and to, by the way, today the blended P.E. is 31.1, the earnings yield is only 3%. Back here, your earnings yield would have been also below 6.5%, 7%. But the point is you went 1, 2, 3, 4, and it looks like about a quarter of a year, all the way to March of 2012, and you would have actually made zero money on this investment. Your $10,000 would have fallen to $8,755 had you originally invested $10,000. You would have received $1,200 in dividends, but add dividends up with your capital loss and you end up with a negative 0.1-tenth of 1% per annum. In other words, 10000 including dividends, turned into 9988 And that's a four-year time frame. Now, in this age of immediate immediacy, you know, where everybody's looking for, you know, how much money I'm making right now, this four years is an eternity. Now, you know, it looks rather benign when I look at this graph because then from here, we go through this period where the stock got significantly overvalued. The PE here was 19, almost 20. And yet, had you bought it here, I want to point out you would have made a great deal of money. You'd have averaged over 18% a year owning the stock. Now, this was a time when the business did great. The dividend, if you look at the bottom of the graph here, increased year after year after year. So this is really a great investment. And the point is, it was overvalued during this whole time frame. Now, I'm going to add the normal P.E. here because this kind of gives me more of what I would call a fair valuation range, because I want you just to see how incredibly overvalued this stock has become. So if I'm looking at a PE between 15 and 17, you know, going from 2015 all the way back, the stock pretty much stays within that range. It gets below that range at times, 
gets a little bit above that range in times, but generally speaking, a PE of between 15 and 17 is going to be reasonably normal. And you know, when it's below 17 and below 15, it's really an opportunity. When it gives above that, it then becomes a dangerous overvaluation situation. This stock has been overvalued for all this time, but yet you would have still made, you know, really good money. Even if you look at, you know, go back to my little four-year analogy here, and you owned it for the last four years when it was extremely overvalued, you know, over this period of time, you still would have averaged 22% a year. So, you know, that happens and that happens quite often. Now, moving on, let's look at Church and Dwight. Another classic example. I just want to repeat a second time here. I love the consistency of this business. Year after year after year, the earnings grow you know, without fail. The dividend, they had a very low payout ratio in these years, and then they increased their payout ratio. And you can see that where I stacked the dividends on top of the earnings and the company did great. I put price on the graph. Once again, I see a period where the price kind of stayed within a reasonable range, in this case around 15 to 22 times earnings over this time frame. And then we see periods where the valuation got high. And again, those become you know, periods of time where it gets very difficult to make money owning a stock, even a quality blue chip like this. You know, here's a three-year time frame where you averaged about 4.6%. So, you know, as I always say, valuation matters and it matters a lot. The Great Recession gave you the opportunity to buy this stock when it was very inexpensive. And even if I didn't measure it to pure overvaluation, just to what I would call full valuation or up to its normal P.E., you end up making 16%. And it's the same company with all these different results. And then once again, you see this massive disconnect from any kind of reasonable range of fair value and where the stock is trading at today. Love the business, hate the stock. I want to make that clear. Next one we look at is Clorox. And of course, Clorox is an interesting story because of the COVID pandemic. We all know what happened there. But again, a very consistent grower. Average earnings growth is about 7.5%, which is very attractive. You know, the blended PE ratio today is 23.5. If I put the price on this graph, we see that the 15 PE does not come into play except for a couple of years, you know, during and right after the Great Recession. So the normal PE becomes more of a judge here. This is, to me, a classic example of the market putting a premium valuation. This is still voting machine stuff, and the orange line would be the weighing machine stuff that I talked about earlier. But once again now, you see a stock that got disconnected from earnings and the price reverted to the mean. You saw it get really overvalued by last summer, you know, just less, little less than a year ago, and then we see this correction where the stock seems to be moving back into some more normal range of valuation. So valuation matters a lot, but it doesn't mean you're going to lose money. I want to reemphasize that. It simply means that you're taking on a lot more risk, often that generate a lot lower rates of return. You know, in this case, I'm looking at earning seven and a half percent, where had I bought this stock when it was fair valued, I could have owned it for several years and averaged over 12 and a half percent. So the valuation really matters, and it matters a lot. Moving on here, I'll just go ahead and build the charts. Here we got a company like Disney. COVID came along. Of course, we know they closed their theme parks. They closed their cruise lines, their streaming business, and so on. And their movie business was also impacted greatly as far as launching new movies. But they were able to still you know, maintain some profitability. The company even completely eliminated their dividend. And yet we saw this you know, sharp correction from the flash crash of COVID. But then, you know, since then, the stock has rallied very strongly and it's starting to perhaps show a little weakness now. And the point I'm making is valuation matters and it matters a lot. Disney got pretty overvalued back in 2015 with a PE of 23. Now the PE, the blended PE today is 76, but now be careful, make sure you understand what that means. That's simply because earnings went into a, really this is an aberration. You know, this was a once in a hundred year event that caused the stock's earnings to drop so precipitously or the business's earnings to drop so precipitously. But here you could argue they held on to their reputation and so on, and the stock did really well. But over, again, about a three- or four-year period, you could have lost money owning Disney if you bought it when it was overvalued. And the reason I keep bringing these up is, would you have had the fortitude, the willingness 
to hold the stock through this period of time. When it got here, would your inclination be it was time to get out, especially during COVID, or would you have been courageous enough to hold it and you know participate in the rally that occurred? Because again, anytime you get these overvaluations, I go back here into April of 2022, we get the PE of 36, which is a very high multiple for the stock historically. And if I hold it to just coming out of the recession, you know, I'm making about 3.4%. And I want to emphasize the company did really well during this period of time. So, you know, these blue chip stocks can still make you money when they're overvalued, but they become a lot more risky and frankly, even a lot more volatile and a lot more dangerous. You know, you see the same with Cisco. We go back to a period of here where Cisco got massively overvalued at 29 times earnings. Once again, we have a very high PE because Cisco obviously serves the restaurant industry and it was impacted dramatically by COVID. We saw earnings collapse. The company maintained its dividend, interestingly enough. And then, you know, it did have flash crash and then it's recovered. And of course, earnings are beginning to recover and the dividend has continued to grow during this period of time. But once again, we could go a very long period of time here with a negative rate of return because of overvalued. But then to be fair and balanced in this discussion, I can also hold this stock for a very long period of time, notwithstanding this big bout of volatility here where I could have made 12 or 13 percent a year, even though by any definition that I would ever use, the stock was massively overvalued. Moving on, we got Costco. Now, Costco is such a popular stock. It's always trading at a premium valuation historically. These are special dividends. So they've even, you know, at times pay out special dividends. I think there's been another one here that I'm not picking up on the graph yet. But if I go into the new version of FastGraph, which we're working feverishly to launch, and then go ahead and plot Costco for you, because I want to show you a couple other things here where I've got speed. And that is the fact that if I look at Costco from some of these other metrics like operating cash flow, I get a much better correlation between cash flow and earnings. But even then, the stock is trading at a very high valuation. EBITDA, which is also kind of a soft form of cash flow, if you will. And that we get a very strong relationship between a normal price to EBITDA of around 12. And here, once again, we see significant overvaluation. And a metric we'll be adding with this new version of the tool, which will be the price to sales or the sales. And you can see that the stock has typically traded at about just 0.47. We'll call it 0.5 times sales. And today you're looking at it trading at double that at 0.9 times sales. So Costco, you know, is another example of a great business, a business I would love to own. I take all this stuff off of the graph here, even the, the dividend and the payout ratio line and the dividend line. And this is exactly the kind of business I want to own. 11% growth year after year after year. That's why I love these businesses and now I hate their stocks. Air products and chemicals, another example of a stock that traded at attractive valuation. For sake of being concise here, I'm going to start going quicker. I wanted you to see how many of these great blue chip iconic names are overvalued. McDonald's, of course, you know, you can see how it traded at reasonable valuations, got significantly overvalued. Hormel, meat company, I want you to notice how much more volatile the stock gets when these valuations get high. Another indicator of risk. Abbott Labs, you know, which we've talked about, has gotten, you know, just crazy high valuation. But again, three or four years of owning the stock and making good money. Coca-Cola, another example of a stock that's perennially overvalued. Um, I do want to take a look at Coke also through the lens of the new fast graphs where I can show you some additional metrics that we'll be adding here on, you know, Coca-Cola. And you see the price to sales, you know, rationale was a little better, but yet Coke still remains overvalued. If I look at it based on operating cash flow, I get a little better valuation reference. And again, the same with even free cash flow, you know, where generally Coca-Cola has covered their dividend. But this is not a real fast growing stock. I do want to make that clear. It only grows at about five and a half percent a year. Pepsi, very, very similar. Trades at a normal P.E. of about 20.7. It did get real attractive coming for the next two or three years. This would have been a great time to be buying stocks. We all know that. But once again, if you pay these very high valuations, you can go through long extended periods of time where you get subpar rates of return. But you can also own the stock during you know, what I'll call periods of high valuation where you make reasonable rates of turn, almost 10% annualized you know, from June of um, 2013 to May of 2021, even though the stock has been overvalued for 
the vast majority of that time frame. Johnson & Johnson, this is the AAA rated mighty J&J. &J. Again, I want you to just, you know, I've shown this before, look at the importance of valuation, the PE of 31 back here, you know, at its peak. This is just coming out of the Great Recession, which ended in 2001. And you go all the way out here more than a decade, and you average about 2.5%, 2.7% during a time when you owned a company that was giving you double-digit earnings growth and even double-digit dividend growth rates, by the way, during this period of time. And yet your rate of return was very, very poor simply because of valuation. But now you could have owned this stock all this time frame here during the period where it's been generally fully valued to overvalued and made 10% a year. Overvaluation doesn't mean you're going to lose money. Overvaluation simply means you're taking more risk than you should to earn a lower rate of return than you deserve, in my opinion. But what I really want to emphasize is when you're entering overvaluation, you're entering the realm of speculation. Now, there's some other factors here that I think are also important and come into play. A company like T. Rowe Price, for example, you know, which is an asset management company, you can see that it's overvalued now, but it actually does offer a decent you know, shot at making a, at least a market average rate of return over the next two or three years. But if you could have bought the stock when it was really inexpensive back here, you know, we'll call it during COVID, you could have made 25, 26% a year. Here's where you've got a margin of safety working to your benefit. That's the key point there. UGI, which is a gas utility, you can see the very strong correlation between earnings and price. You can see the danger of overvaluation when it happens. You can also see the benefit of undervaluation when it happens. If you can buy these stocks when they've got a strong margin of safety, you can massively expand your rate of return and you're doing it at significantly less risk than you are when you're buying the same business with essentially the same future and even same history at much higher valuations. Now, there are some really classic good dividend growth stocks that I think are attractive. Amerisource Bergen, for one, I believe is very attractive here. And then I'm going to end with Walgreens because this kind of sums everything up for me, if you will. It gives me all of the lessons that I've tried to convey about valuation. Here, Walgreens was very overvalued coming out of the 2001 recession, which you can barely see here. Here was the lost decade. Actually, you went, you know, a full 10 years of actually losing money owning Walgreens when the business was actually performing well. The orange line was growing and the white line was growing, but then you could have bought it when it had a margin of safety. And even though it was way overvalued here and even got volatile, you could have averaged 23% a year here for another, you know, five year period of time during this period of time. And then, you know, recently the stock has been underwater and, you know, has fallen dramatically. But here you see all the many faces of valuation as well as all the risks and the opportunity it can produce. But here's another interesting factor. When this got so inexpensive, everybody hated the stock here, hated CVS. We had the opioid crisis. There was all kinds of discussions about Amazon putting them out of business, blah, blah, blah. Now, all of a sudden, the recovery of this stock moving back to intrinsic value seems to be very, very profound. So, you know, the bottom line here is valuation matters and it matters a lot. I wanted you to get a sense by going through all these companies here, and I'm going to go through them very, very quickly here again with my, you know, new and improved version coming out here pretty soon, just so I can go through it quickly with you. I just want you to see the valuations here are extremely high for these companies. They're trading at valuations that are simply unjustified. I'm using free cash flow here. I want to go back to operating earnings for you because I want you to see what I covered most. You know, all of these stocks are trading significantly above anything that would justify fair valuation. You could make a lot of money doing it here, but eventually you start to get these corrections, and that's the whole point. So as you go through these blue chips, there's Walgreens inexpensive, Next Air Energy, my favorite utility on the planet, just trading at a ludicrously high valuation, as you can see. You know, McCormick, the spice company, the valuations are crazy today. And you can see the volatility, and it's very, very difficult to own stocks like this. Disney was going through all its struggles. Its business is, is recovering and expected to recover, but you're paying a very high price to buy it today. Even Johnson & Johnson is not crazy overvalued like some of them, but this is not an opportune time or optimum time to buy Johnson & Johnson. McDonald's, significantly overvalued. Cisco, the food company, significantly overvalued. 
Walmart, again, the quintessential story of valuation, just like I did with Walgreens Boots Alliance, you could have owned this stock for a very long period of time here, you know, going all the way from January of 2001 to September of 2011 and made less than a half a percent a year, including dividends during a time when Walmart was just growing incredibly strongly and very consistently and raising their dividend every year. So I hope you got some further insights into what valuation is all about and got a chance to look at some several businesses just so you're clear. I love the businesses, hate the stocks. This has been Chuck Carnival saying thanks for watching. Of course, if you like the video, you know, give me a like, ring the bell, subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. I really appreciate you guys. And I look forward to talking to you again tomorrow.